Welcome to this special Gastro Girl podcast. This episode was produced in collaboration with the American College of Gastroenterology's Patient Care Committee. Here's your host, Jacqueline Gollin. Hey everyone, welcome to the Gastro Girl podcast. This is a special episode brought to you by the American College of Gastroenterology's Patient Care Committee. And today we're joined by Dr. Naveen Nasser Godsey of UMass Chan Medical School in Worcester, Mass. She's a gastroenterologist and expert in the gallbladder biliary area as well as hepatology. And we're so excited because this month, February, is Gallbladder Cancer and Bile Duct Cancer Awareness Month. And this is a topic that often doesn't get a lot of coverage. And we really wanted to bring you the basics today so you have a better understanding about the gallbladder, the biliary system, and what could go wrong and when to see your doctor. Welcome, Dr. Nasser Ghazi. So great to see you today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Excited to talk about this important topic. Thank you. Well, let's get started. So for those of us who may not know, could you give us a brief overview of the biliary system, its role in the body and the digestive system, and why it's so important? Absolutely. So the bile ducts are basically a series of small tubules that carry bile from the liver and have a few different important functions, including helping to eliminate waste and to break down fat for digestion. So the bile ducts um, are kind of like the branches of a tree within the liver. So there's the common bile duct, which is the main bile duct outside of the liver that enters into the liver. And as you go farther into the liver, that main bile duct starts to branch smaller and smaller into these tiny bile ducts throughout the liver. It also connects to the gallbladder through something called the cystic duct. And the gallbladder is basically like a storage system to hold bile that then can be excreted through the bile duct and again, help with elimination of waste and breakdown of fat. So it plays a pretty important role in our digestive system. Definitely. And when things start to go wrong, such as if bile isn't being carried out normally, um, patients can have issues um, with fat breakdown. And if the bile ducts get plugged up, patients can start to develop jaundice or yellowing of the eyes or skin. Yeah. So let's talk about um, now that we understand the role. And again, this is a high level and we can provide resources for patients to dig a little deeper. But what other signs and symptoms would patients experience to know that something's wrong with either their gallbladder or those bile ducts? Absolutely. So a lot of times if patients have, say, a cancer of the bile ducts or of the gallbladder, they may have no symptoms at all, which is kind of frightening. But some symptoms that can suggest there are issues can be kind of nonspecific symptoms like abdominal pain, weight loss. But one of the earlier signs and symptoms can be when patients start to develop yellowing of the eyes or skin. And that can indicate, for example, if there's a mass that's blocking the bile duct from um, eliminating the bile normally. Both gallbladder cancer and a bile duct cancer, which we call cholangiocarcinoma, are incredibly rare. But there are some known risk factors or um, conditions that can increase your risk for both of those cancers. So that's a great uh, segue into what are some of the risk factors that patients should be aware of? Sure. So the main one in the United States for cholangiocarcinoma or bile duct cancer is a condition which some of your listeners may have heard of called PSC, primary sclerosing cholangitis. This is a, a type of autoimmune liver disorder that causes scarring of the bile ducts. But really, when you think of it, things such as viruses like hepatitis B or C, parasites, which are more common in um, Eastern Asia, really any disorder that causes chronic inflammation of the bile ducts, such as bile duct stones, stones within the liver ducts, um, and can also cause inflammation that can increase your risk of cholangiocarcinoma. Is there an age, you know, that disappears or a demographic? Is it more common in men than women? It's a what? great question. So for cholangiocarcinoma, it's really kind of important to break it up into two groups when we're thinking about the population in the U.S. And that's really either patients who have de novo cholangiocarcinoma, meaning no real risk factors, or patients with PSC. So patients with PSC tend to be younger patients 
um, typically in their 40s or early on in their diagnosis of PSC, whereas patients with no risk factors, what we call de novo cholangiocarcinoma, tend to be older, so more likely in their seventh decade. Interestingly, for gallbladder cancer, this is very often diagnosed incidentally, for example, like at the time of a gallbladder surgery, but in general, it tends to be older adults as well. Now, is, this, is there a genetic component to this or lifestyle factors or what, what should we know about that area? That's a great question. So there are some associations with gallbladder cancer, for example, with like obesity, things that increase the risk of gallstones or gallbladder polyps. For cholangiocarcinoma, if we're thinking about risk factors, again, it's things that are contributing to underlying liver disease or cirrhosis. Um, but there isn't necessarily like a familial genetic component that we know of yet, but there's still a lot of research going on into some of the kind of underlying molecules and genetics that are driving both cholangiocarcinoma and gallbladder cancer. You keep mentioning the connection with the liver, which I think is fascinating. Could you, if we could segue for a little bit, what is the relationship between the gallbladder and the liver for patients? And, you know, if does... You know, so I know fatty liver and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and even regular, you know, alcoholic liver disease has really increased, especially since the COVID pandemic. So does that have any cause and effect at all? It, you know, is, are those maybe connected in some way? If the liver is not functioning, does it affect the gallbladder or vice versa? Yeah, so certainly underlying cirrhosis can increase the risk of cholangiocarcinoma, but it is probably more likely in patients who their liver disease is as a result of some sort of inflammation in the bile ducts in particular, such as with PSC, for example. Um, but we do see patients with underlying cirrhosis developing cholangiocarcinoma, the more likely type of cancer that patients with cirrhosis, regardless of the etiology develop, is called hepatocellular carcinoma. It's actually the primary liver cancer. And as opposed to cholangiocarcinoma, which is cancer of the cells that line the bile ducts called cholangiocytes, hepatocellular carcinoma is um, cancer of the cells of the liver called hepatocytes. And so there's kind of a different risk factor, but Certainly patients with underlying cirrhosis are at risk of cholangiocarcinoma, but that risk is higher for highest for patients with PSC. That's interesting. Thank you. I know you're doing some really exciting research in this area. What are some of the projects that you're working on or the, or the connections that you're trying to uh, find out if there's associations with that patients yeah. may be interested in? So I think one of the really important things for patients to know is that cholangiocarcinoma can be hard to diagnose. So it can be really patchy in terms of where it develops along the bile ducts. And the current tools that we have are really suboptimal. So different ways that we help with diagnosing cholangiocarcinoma include um, an endoscopy where we put like a tiny scope basically into the bile duct. And from there, we can take brushings, we can take uh, tiny biopsies of the bile duct. But again, you can imagine if the cancer is patchy, it can be hard to diagnose. And cholangiocarcinoma also doesn't have a lot of like necessarily cancer cells. And so there's a lot of scar tissue and that can be hard to diagnose as well when you're kind of sorting through all the inflammation, the scar tissue to actually diagnose the cancer itself. So right now we're trying to develop some ancillary tools such as using artificial intelligence to add to the toolbox in terms of helping with the diagnosis of cholangiocarcinoma. So right now, you know, we have the brushings, we have biopsies. We can actually use a mini camera in the bile ducts that's called cholangioscopy to visually look at the bile ducts and see if the endoscopist can help with the diagnosis just by looking. Um, and then we also are developing artificial intelligence to try and aid with that. We have some different molecular testing and next generation sequencing. Um, these are other tools um, to try and improve the overall sensitivity of the current diagnostic tools we have. What is the prognosis? Is, is it usually diagnosed in a late stage and they don't have a, a long term uh, outlook? Or is it something they would just remove the gallbladder? and they would just go on? Like, what, is, what does it look like? 
So it's a great question. So it really depends on if patients have PSC or if they have no underlying risk factors. So patients with PSC, and this may be some of your listeners, they are under a surveillance protocol. So for example, for cholangiocarcinoma, they get imaging typically once a year or twice a year if they also have cirrhosis as a result of their PSC, um, along with tumor markers called a CA199. And this is to help with surveillance for cholangiocarcinoma because of the increased risk compared to the general population. So patients with PSC are typically diagnosed earlier uh, because they're under surveillance. Um, whereas sometimes or oftentimes patients without any underlying risk factors may be presenting at a later stage because they may not be presenting until they're developing symptoms such as abdominal pain, weight loss, jaundice. And at that time, the cancer may have become more advanced. Now, the treatment really actually depends on the location of the bile duct cancer. So whether it is in the main bile duct kind of outside of the liver versus inside of the liver. So for example, what we call extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma or distal cholangiocarcinoma, this is kind of in the bottom half of the bile duct. And that's actually treated with a, um, a Whipple surgery if it's localized. And that's where the surgeon will remove the bile duct, part of the pancreas, part of the small intestine and the gallbladder. And then oftentimes those patients will get some sort of chemotherapy after surgery. Now, patients with cancer, cholangiocarcinoma within the liver called intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, depending on their underlying liver disease, they might be a candidate for a surgery to actually remove the cancer versus um, some sort of systemic chemotherapy or even local therapy, what we think of as um, kind of targeted therapy right at the tumor itself. There is a lot of emerging data that highly selected patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma may do well with liver transplantation, whereas previously that was actually thought to be a contraindication. Now, the, the one that I'm most interested in that we see often in the liver transplant world is um, bile duct cancer, right? Kind of what we call the hilum, perihilar cholangiocarcinoma. This is kind of where the bile ducts meet in the liver and then start to branch out. So for highly selected patients or patients with PSC who meet specific criteria, they're actually candidates for liver transplantation, and this is considered the best curative option. They undergo a, a pretty rigorous therapy of chemotherapy and radiation ahead of transplant, but that's really considered the best option for highly selected patients with perihilar cholangiocarcinoma. And now, pac for, uh, excuse me, yeah, so patients yeah. would work closely with their, obviously their, their doctor to see if they're a candidate and what they would exactly. need to do to prepare yeah. for that. Option. Exactly. So patients often will see a multidisciplinary team, and that could include a medical oncologist, a hepatologist or a liver doctor, and a surgeon. And oftentimes their imaging and all their studies would be reviewed at a multidisciplinary tumor board so that we're able to review, you know, the extent of the tumor, the patient, um, if they have underlying liver disease, what the patient's functional status is so that we can come up with the best treatment option for them. My other question is, what is there anything we can do to prevent this from happening, from preventing from gallbladder or bile duct cancer? It's a great question. You know, I think for patients with PSC, not only do they have an increased risk of cholangiocarcinoma, but they also have an increased risk of gallbladder cancer. So patients with PSC, I would encourage that they, uh, you know, maintain contact with their liver doctor, their hepatologist, and they stay up to date on their routine surveillance scans. For patients without PSC, it's really about, you know, overall, I think, living a healthy lifestyle. For example, if they have hepatitis C, knowing that there's great treatment options, which are curative. Um, like you said, um, the rise of what we, it's used to be called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We actually, it's a much longer term now called metabolic associated uh, dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease. So basically trying to reduce the risk factors for too much fat in the liver, maintaining a healthy weight, um, controlling diabetes, high blood pressure, sleep apnea, high cholesterol, those sorts of things. Um, and patients, for example, for gallbladder cancer, if they have known 
gallbladder polyps, they are typically recommended to un be under some sort of surveillance program for those gallbladder polyps. So if you have certain you know, risk factors, make sure that you're in touch with your gastroenterologist or hepatologist to make sure you're under the proper surveillance plan. So I, I want to pick up on what you just said. First of all, thank you for that insight. But you mentioned gallbladder polyps. That's something that we often hear that happens in the colon, uh, polyps. So how would, you know, how would somebody know that they have polyps in their gallbladder? Would they have to have a, like a gallbladder attack and then they go and get, you know, screened and they see it on yeah. there? Like, that's really interesting. Right. Yeah. So gallbladder polyps, yep, it's similar. It's like similar to um, polyps that you can develop in the stomach or in the um, colon. So gallbladder polyps can be diagnosed incidentally. So say you have a scan for some reason. Maybe somebody has incidental, um, you know, or just kind of nonspecific right upper quadrant pain. Maybe their doctor is thinking it's gallstones. And in fact, maybe they have a gallbladder polyp and no gallstones. So depending on, you know, if they have PSC or not and the size of the polyp, there's um, different recommendations for a surveillance, ul surveillance ultrasound. Um, and if the polyps reach a certain size, then it's recommended to actually undergo a gallbladder surgery, taking out the gallbladder itself, because as the polyps get larger, there's an increased risk that they could turn into cancer. Like you said, it's very similar to colon polyps. Um, so patients may not know, so they'd have to have had a scan for some reason, for example, if somebody thought they had gallstones or gallstone disease. So just to clarify, so those gallbladder well, polyps could turn cancerous, just like in the colon, you remove those to mm -hmm. in order to prevent colon cancer. Is it similar? It's similar in the sense that um, you don't actually like remove the polyps themselves okay. from the gallbladder. They're typically under surveillance with an ultrasound until they may reach a certain size. And then it's recommended that the gallbladder comes out. Oh, um, okay. So depending on the size, the interval of the ultrasound varies. And depending on if you have PSC or not, and if that gallbladder polyp grows to a certain size, then your gastroenterologist may refer you to a surgeon for a gallbladder surgery. Wow. It's so interesting. I learned something new every time I talk to you wonderful experts because it's like amazing how the body works. Well, Is there anything that we missed um, or anything that you want to say, uh, any tips you want to give to patients? Yeah. Um, so I would say if, um, you know, in terms of the symptoms that we were discussing, certainly new onset jaundice, yellowing of the eyes or skin. Another is itching, especially, you know, itching in the absence of a rash, um, abdominal pain, weight loss. These are definitely some of the symptoms that should prompt you to see your doctor. And um, typically um, blood work and imaging can help, you know, at least start the workup for the diagnosis. But also recognizing that both of these cancers are very, very rare. Um, and especially with um, patients without underlying PSC, cholangiocarcinoma is very rare. Whereas patients with PSC, it's really important to make sure that you're staying up to date on your routine surveillance blood work and your scans. Wonderful. And then finally, are there any resources that you're aware of uh, for patient support that you would recommend? Definitely. So the Clangiocarcinoma Foundation is a great resource for patients, caregivers. They have great information on um, current research, resources for patients who are um, facing a diagnosis of clangiocarcinoma um, and connecting you with other experts in the field. Wonderful. We'll put that up on the screen on our um, podcast and we'll also put it in the description so folks can um, find uh, and access those wonderful resources. Dr. Nazar Godsey, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been so informative, and we hope to have you on another episode um, in the near future. Thank awesome. you so much. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you for listening to the Gastro Girl Podcast. For more information and resources, please visit gastrogirl.com. Do you have a question for Gastro Girl? Please email podcast at gastrogirl.com. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in the Gastro Girl podcast are not a substitute for medical advice from your healthcare professional. Please consult a licensed clinician in your state regarding all matters related to your health.